So thank you all for joining us tonight for our session. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started here. But before we jump too far in, I um, want to make sure um, to take a moment to introduce you to one of our sponsors, which is Neola. Our Get On Board campaign is supported generously by them. Um, effective policies, as many of you will find out when you um, become elected, effective policies are the core of successful school board, school district governance, and one of the primary functions of a school board member. Maintaining policies that reflect both local oversight and ever-changing state and federal laws is an enormous task. School board members can rely on the MASB NEOLA partnership to keep their policy manuals up to date. Working together, MASB and NEOLA produce uniform school policies and guidelines to better serve all Michigan school districts. You can head to Neola's website at neola.com to learn more about how they help school districts and set direction for policy. So if you want to introduce yourself, Debbie. Okay, so good evening, everybody. My name is Debbie Stair. I'm the Assistant Director for Leadership Development at MASD. I've been on staff for just over nine years, but prior to that, I was a Longtime board member myself. I served uh, over 15 years in my local district, served on the ISD board, and also served on MASB's board of directors as well. Um, and before I turn it back to you, Shelly, um, we also have a couple of other people on with us this evening that I just want to acknowledge. Um, we have Steve Heyer, who is now officially our MASB board of directors president. Um, and he's going to interject some comments here and there uh, this evening. Steve, you want to just kind of introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I am a school board member in Clarkston. I've been, this is my 22nd year, I think, being on the school board that just rolled around. So <clears throat> I've been around a while. I probably haven't seen everything because every time I think I do, something new comes up. But I look forward to uh, sharing kind of uh, how I've, viewed school board service over the years and how things have changed. And, you know, there's a rewarding part. There can be a frustrating part. Um, but we are definitely excited to see all of you on the webinar tonight and certainly encourage you all to get involved and run as appropriate in your particular areas. And we'll give you all the tips and tricks and, and things to watch out for and things to pay attention for in that process here tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Steve. And then also with us this evening, is our Director of the Leadership uh, Development and Executive Search Services, uh, Greg Shostakowski. And Greg, I don't know if you want to say anything or you just want to kind of hang out in the background tonight. Looks like Sorry, I'm getting out. the... Oh, there I, I'm just going to hang out in the background, Debbie. I, I welcome everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, working on getting Zoom to work on the brand new laptop. So <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. All right. All right, thanks, Greg. Okay, Shelly, back to you. That's always a good time, isn't it? Technology. <laughs> so I'm Shelly Davis Boyd. I'm the Director of Communications, PR, and Marketing at the Michigan Association of School Boards. Been here for just over three years. I have never been a school board member, but I have the utmost respect for the, the hard work that schools do, uh, school board members do. I'm very active in my kids' school um, in other ways, um, but have, have not chosen to be on the school board. But again, really appreciate everything that you folks do to help our districts and our children. So who is the Michigan Association of School Boards? We are a voluntary nonprofit association of local and intermediate school boards of education located in Michigan. We represent nearly 100% of school districts in Michigan, and our membership is compromised of 600 plus boards of education. Our mission is to provide high quality educational leadership services for all Michigan boards of education and to advocate for equitable and exceptional public education for all students. If you're elected this November, um, if you're elected this November, so long as your district is a member of 
MASB, you'll be a member yourself. And we're here to help you in your role as a school board member to make you the most effective in your role individually and as a team. We offer both individual and whole board development opportunities, including online and in-person courses and workshops. We, off, we also offer a variety of services such as superintendent search, um, should a vacancy occur, legal counsel, and strategic planning for your district. Later on, we'll talk about some of the resources that will be most helpful to you in your first year of service. So let's talk about tonight's agenda and what we are going to cover. Um, so while we're getting into that, why don't you uh, take a minute to introduce yourself to folks in the chat box. So if you wanna go ahead, tell us your name, what, plan, what district you plan to run in and what you're hoping to learn tonight while I'm covering this, um, that would be really great. So go ahead and get the chat going. And we probably ought to tell our folks that we are recording this session tonight um, so that we can put it up on our website um, for others who might not have been able to attend uh, one of our live webinars. They can still be, um, be able to see a, a version of the uh, town hall meeting, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. That's a good call. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about tonight, and I see some chats starting to come in, is why run, including some of the history of the Get On Board campaign and why there is a need for you to run for school boards. Then we'll move into how school boards influence student success. That'll be followed by the role of a board member, and it is much more than one meeting per month. Next, we'll cover some important election information you need to know to make sure you get your name on the ballot. We'll go over some key election dates in both pre-election and post-election checklists. Should you be elected, we'll talk about the getting ready. To, we'll talk about getting ready to serve. Um, there's plenty you can start doing to prepare before you step into your board position to make sure that you're set up for success. And then we'll wrap up with some additional resources for you to take advantage of. And keep things coming in the chat. Debbie's monitoring that. So if you have any questions as we're moving along, feel free to, to pop those in there so we can make sure that we get you all the information you came here for tonight. So why is there a need to run? Our Get On Board campaign was initially launched in 2014 due to a shift that we saw here at the Michigan Association of School Boards after a legislation change. In 2012, the Michigan legislature shifted school board elections from May of every year to the general election in November of even years. And this is when we saw a substantial increase in unfiled seats. So it's important to note that this does not mean that there's one person who's running unopposed for that seat. That means unfiled seats are those that no one is even on a ballot for that seat. In the 2018 election, 7.3% of all available school board seats were not filed for by the deadline. And while this figure is down from the 10% of unfiled for seats we saw in 2014 election, there's still a lot more work to do to continue to close that gap. So the goal of, the campaign, of this campaign is to inform the public about what serving on a local school board entails and to encourage more civic-minded, student-focused people to run for Board of Education seats um, through grassroots efforts. As part of the campaign, we really lead in, lean into the data to guide us. Um, in non-election years, we commissioned a statewide poll through survey research firm Epic MRA that asked hundreds of general election voters several questions about school boards. What we have found is there's a huge unawareness of school board seats their responsibilities and their roles, as well as the process of running for an open seat. With Get On Board campaign, um, we've seen some success with the Get On Board campaign, plus with these informational events being virtual, we're able to reach more people around the state to help shift that public awareness. Now take a look at this quote. I'll go ahead and read it for you. Board members, because they represent the people and have the power to act, and superintendents, because they have professional knowledge and the responsibility to lead and manage, 
are close enough to communities and schools to see what needs to be done and are powerful enough to do it. They are the governance team. So what one or two words sticks out to you? And go ahead and let us know in the chat. And Debbie, while they're popping things in the chat, what do you think our viewers should focus on or learn from this quote? Oops, if I unmute myself. Um, I want to start with the very last line. Sounds a little counterintuitive to start at the end, but the whole idea of together, they are the governance team. So the superintendent and the elected and or appointed board members working together to govern the district. And I think that's a key phrase. And you're gonna hear that as we move through the session tonight. And Marissa, you got it, teamwork with the superintendent. Um, you're gonna hear that repeated multiple times because it is critical to the work of a district that a board and superintendent can work together effectively. I don't know, Steve, do you wanna join in? You usually have something to say about this slide. Sure, I think I, I think that the team is such an important aspect of you know anybody can run for school board, and what I always say is any Yahoo can run for school board. Like you need no special skills that will cover the requirements of what you need to have to run for school board, but the, the skill set is not one of them. Uh, anything, and so you know the the school board collectively works together and decides who is the right person to lead this school district and hires a superintendent, the superintendent's the expert in the field that has the skill set that's going to lead. And I really, I'll, I'll take kind of a local control aspect of, you know, the communities and schools, like what's what's right in Ironwood is is hell and gone different from what's probably right in Plymouth Canton. And, 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 and that's different from what's right here in Clarkston. And so I think, you know, having locally elected folks where you're making decisions for your kids and your community is really powerful because especially during the pandemic, it hit home when we were making decisions. It's like my kids in school had to live with those decisions. I had to live with those decisions as, as a family. And so if it would be really easy for me to make those decisions for some other kids somewhere else, but when it hits home, that's really important. And so that team approach really makes those decisions and decides really what's appropriate in your community. Thanks, Steve. Um, a couple of other comments that uh, a couple of you put in, uh, you know, as far as the superintendent, Suzanne, you put, you know, superintendents have the knowledge and responsibility to lead and manage. And we're going to talk about what that looks like and how that looks different. Their responsibilities from board members this evening. Um, and so um, all of you who put something in the chat, you were right on. Those are all very key pieces to this work that you're potentially um, thinking of undertaking here. Steve brought us right to our next slide. So thank you very much, President Heyer. Uh, so let's talk about what it takes for you to get on the ballot. Um, if you can check off these five items, you're eligible to run for a school board seat in Michigan. You must be at least 18 years old, a citizen of the United States. You need to be a qualified school elector, which means you need to be a registered voter in the school district where you'll run a resident of Michigan for at least 30 days, a resident of the school district where you will run for at least 30 days prior to the election. And this year, as a reminder, the election is on November 8th. If you meet all of these requirements, it's really simple. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie, who's gonna talk about what you how you can make a difference. All right. So we have a little clip to show you, and um, we've actually taken this clip out of our foundations for um, school boardsmanship. It's our, our foundational class. And um, I think it really does a really good job of laying out really what to think about this work that, again, you're thinking um, of taking on. Uh, because so many board members come to the table thinking the job is one thing, when in reality, it's something different. And so I, we're going to sort of highlight it with this video, and then we're going to have um, some more discussion about it. So Shelly, I'm going to let you go ahead and start that for us.
My school is a busy place, and there's always a lot going on in our classroom. If you look around on any given day, you'll see my class at work reading and writing, creating and engineering, thinking and growing. All of this is possible, though, because of a lot of work and planning that happened long before my class and I arrived. And it all starts with vision. The vision of the school district begins with teamwork between the superintendent and the school board. Together they view the school district from way up high. From up there at 10,000 feet, they oversee the whole school system. They see how parts relate to the whole. They see the big picture, and their perspective allows them to share what they see with the community and point the way forward. The school board established a vision that includes things like high expectations for student learning and quality instruction. Their job starts with the school district's overall vision, and then they use their own knowledge, experience, and input from our community to create big, long-term goals that we all strive for. The board members dispatch our superintendent and other administrators, like central office personnel and principals, to implement their vision. If the school board is working at 10,000 feet, these administrators are at 2,000 feet. They see a wide picture of the landscape as they oversee specific departments and schools. When it comes to staff development, monitoring student growth, and evaluating teachers, it's our administrators who are leading the way. They lead the groundwork for the school board's vision and goals as they create and implement plans. Next come the teachers and support staff who bring the plans of the administrators and the vision and goals of the school board into reality. Their view isn't from up in the air, it's right at ground level. Teachers are focused on students and providing the structure and opportunities they need to grow and learn in their classrooms. One of the things we students hear all the time is that even if we don't do something perfectly the first time, we shouldn't just give up. Instead, we should try again and learn from what didn't work. Our teachers and administrators do the very same thing. They know that there's always room to learn and grow. So they work together to constantly refine and adjust plans for continuous improvement as we all work toward making the vision of our school board a reality. Everyone in our school district has a role to play in creating a place where students can grow and learn to the very best of their ability. From the school board that starts with the vision to the administrators who plan how to make it happen and keep an eye on progress to the teachers who put those plans into action, to me who is ready to do great things, including getting an A on my math test tomorrow. We are all doing our part to make our district a successful one. And so you heard there a lot about um, that 10,000 foot view, that boards, and the governance team work at that higher level. And I think that's really key to think about because most of us in our everyday lives um, are used to just sort of getting in there and rolling up our sleeves and participating in the actual day-to-day -day work. Um, and at the very least, some of us might be managers of that work, but we're, we're sort of at that ground level. And you saw from the video that that we have a lot of people in school districts who are at that ground level, but board members are not one of them that they really are the ones who oversee the district from that higher level and they employ a superintendent to then manage those day-to-day -day operations. And so I hope that video just kind of helps set the stage for you in thinking about, yep, I have to remember to keep myself up, up at that high level where I'm overseeing what's going on in the district. So what does board service really look like then, if that's the case? If I'm not going to be sitting at the table making day-to-day -day decisions, what really is the role? And I would say it really boils down primarily to these four things. Now, obviously, board members make hundreds, if not thousands of decisions each and every year. But when you really distill it down to the, the most important things that board members are going to make decisions about, it's these four. First one is hiring a superintendent. Now, many of you, if you're elected, you're going to inherit a superintendent that the board previously has hired. Uh, but at some point in time, if you serve long enough, you are likely to find yourself 
as part of that team who will make that decision as to who's going to be the instructional leader of your district. And it, it is by far the most important decision a board member will ever make. Um, in my 15 years, I was lucky enough to participate in two superintendent searches and hired two great people, very different people, but exactly the ones we needed to lead our district um, at those two various times. Related to that, and again, you know, super important is evaluating your superintendent. So remember I said, you know, you're not the one doing that day-to-day -day or that managerial role. Your superintendent is taking that on. <clears throat> and annually, you as a board together will evaluate that superintendent's performance. And that's a critical piece, so, so much so that the legislature uh, made it a requirement for boards to evaluate their superintendent on an annual basis. Again, annually, a board will approve their budget. And honestly, a budget is how a board shows their support around the initiatives and projects and programs that are, are happening in their district. They're ensuring that the resources are available for those who are at that administrative and ground level doing the work to really help achieve that vision that's been identified. And then last but not least are setting district policies. It's through those policies, it's, it's um, a structure that gives the administration and staff um, sort of their boundaries, if you will, of what they're gonna work and how they're gonna work in the district. Um, and so those are the four key points um, that I wanted to highlight at this, at this intersection. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about, so what does it take to be a good board member and a good board? And if you can imagine over the years, there have been uh, just any great number of studies done, research around what, what is an effective teacher what is an effective principal or superintendent. There is no shortage of information on that. But it wasn't until the early 2000s that someone said, hey, exactly what effect does a school board have on student achievement? And what do highly effective boards look like? What are the traits that those boards um, have in place um, that just make them operate at their peak efficiency and effectiveness? And so our counterparts in Iowa uh, undertook this project. Um, so the Iowa School Boards Association, along with their Superintendents Association, their state Department of Education and Iowa University, and did this all encompassing research project. And then actually went back about 10 years after that, just to make sure that, that the findings were still um, valid and reliable and found that they were. So I wanna go over those eight traits with you this evening. And I want you to be thinking about, as I go through them, does this sound like something I wanna be a part of for my district? So the first one is effective school boards commit to a vision of high expectations. And boards ensure that a vision is in place. You heard that word vision in that video multiple times. They ensure that a vision is in place and that all efforts are aimed at accomplishing that vision. Effective school boards have strong shared beliefs and values. They agree that all students can be successful and they put in place the supports necessary for that to happen. Now, many times that vision and those beliefs and values will come out um, of a strategic planning process, but not always. Sometimes districts have um, components without having an overall comprehensive uh, planning process in place but it's really about um, inviting your community in to determine what that vision for your district is and what are those beliefs and values that you hold so dear that they're uncompromising um, in the work that districts do. And those things then help serve as guideposts for decision-making throughout the district, regardless of the role, whether it's from the board or, or down um, to the ground level. Effective school boards are accountability driven. They spend their time as a governance body that oversees and evaluates the work of the superintendent. I mentioned that already. And they don't get bogged down in the day-to-day -day operations. 
um, of, or of managing the district. And so um, think in terms of hiring staff. Um, you really as a board only have one staff member and that's your superintendent. And that superintendent then actually carries out the role of hiring and evaluating staff. Boards make sure that structures are in place to support that work. Boards also have a collaborative relationship with the staff um, and the, the community, so both internally and externally. And this one's often confusing for new board members. It doesn't mean that you have individual conversations and relationships with each staff and community member, but it does mean that you work together with your superintendent, again, to ensure that systems are in place for real two-way communication uh, between the board and the staff, as well as the board and the community, so that it becomes part of the, the data that's collected to assist you as a board in your decision-making processes. Steve, do you have anything you want to add on these first few? Sure. I think, you know, being on a school board is, is different than a lot of other things that you've probably done. You know, at work <clears throat> where, you know, I get to make a decision, it's just, I decide and that's the way it is. And I might get some input, but ultimately I decide. And on a school board, you really have to have other people agree with you. And that's why that shared vision that we've been talking about is so important because if everybody is headed in the same direction, it's much easier to agree on the course of how to get there. And if everybody's going in a different direction, it's much harder to get there. And that's why this accountability piece is is a, a high level accountability piece. I mean, you're not drilling down, making sure you know certain day to day things are done. You have policies that you know really put those those pieces in place, draw the box around you know the district that must be you know operated within. But this collaborative relationship is is so so based on trust and respect more than probably anything else. And that to, to for me to be an effective school board member. I feel like I have to be respected amongst the staff and respected amongst the community. And, and depending on your district, you may have board members that, you know, like to ask gotcha questions or try to catch somebody off guard at a board meeting. And, and th that is not the way to go about this because you will not have a collaborative relationship in that case. If you're trying to get somebody, um, they're obviously not going to have a respect for you. And, and that's not the way to do it. You know, there are plenty of ways to ask questions. There are plenty of ways to ask hard questions that don't put somebody in, in a negative light. Um, you know, with a, we say no surprises, right? If you're going to, if you want to ask a question, you want a certain piece of data, you know, you, you really need to send that question in ahead of time. If you want somebody prepared with a certain data point that they're obviously not going to know off the top of their head. Um, so th this is something that the way you the way you campaign, the way you end up on the school board, the way you interact with your your colleagues um, really matters. And, and you know, I, I've seen um, some very positive and collaborative and trusting teams. And I've seen some fairly destructive teams in, in my tenure in, on the school board. And, and you know, I've I've seen some behaviors from audience members, even some fellow board members where it's like, Hey, would you model that for your kids? You know, I think if you, if you think about what behavior you'd want to model for your children, I think that's a good place to be for, for being, having that collaborative relationship with staff and the community and, and to generate that mutual trust and respect that I would say is really necessary to be an effective board member. Thanks, Steve. So um, to capture our last four traits, um, effective school boards are data savvy, and they really understand the importance of using data in the decision-making process, and they work together with the superintendent to determine what data is going to be most useful. You know, one of the things that is so different from when I first started as a board member, we had very little data then, and we were searching for ways to collect that data. Now, on the flip side, we have so much data that we have to really make good decisions about what data is important to use and what data don't we, don't we need to collect. Um, and so really having that, again, collaborative relationship to determine upfront what are we gonna use uh, because it's gonna be the most useful in tracking and supporting student achievement. Effective boards also align and sustain resources 
they really ensure that the necessary resources are available. Remember, I talked about that at budget time to achieve their mission and vision. Um, and, you know, that includes things like materials and professional development, even in tough budget times. Um, some of the hardest decisions um, that board members make is around the budget and, you know, what's critical, what, what do we have to have in place, even when we ma are making cuts in other areas. Um, but it's those, it's, again, it's through those resources and that budget that you show um, what's really important as a board. The last two effective school boards lead as a unified team with the superintendent. Um, this does not mean that every vote is a 7-0. It won't be, and it shouldn't be. Um, but it does mean that supportive initiatives once a vote has been taken. And Steve, I'll let you talk about that one because that's not always easy to do. No, it, it, it definitely is not. And, and when, you, when you are sort of... I'll say fighting, but not, not in, a, in the true sense. If you're pushing for something that you believe is absolutely the best course of action and you are, you are pushing hard on that and the vote goes 6-1, 5-2, you're, you're on the losing side, even 4-3, and, and you lost and you truly believe that's what's best for kids and what's best for the community, th that's a tough, a tough one to come away with. And, and really that's where like you don't get to just decide. You have to have other people agree with you. And so part of being on the school board is, is you know, a little bit of teamwork. You know, we've mentioned the word team a number of times now. Um, you've got to have, you know, a respect of your colleagues. You've got to be able to convince them that maybe your way of looking at something is, is positive, is maybe the right way. More often than not, um, when you have seven people on a school board and a superintendent administration, nobody's singular idea up front is probably the, the best idea going forward. You know, that's why we have a, a team here. It's like when you put all your heads together, you give your superintendent input, ultimately your superintendent can come away with maybe the best plan given everything you've thrown at him or her. And, and, and that sort of collaboration where there's some consensus building, maybe everybody compromises a little bit. Um, th that's ideal. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But when you have to, when you have to go home that night and your spouse asks you, how was the board meeting? And you are just, you know, beside yourself because you think the wrong decision was made. It is really tough to stay positive. And, and maybe a, a, a newspaper calls the next day or, a, you know, a media or maybe even parents. And, and at that point, the right thing to do is to say, this is the way the board voted, and I support that decision because that's the way the board voted. And if you were to say, well, the board voted this way, but that really was the wrong decision, and here's what we should have done, um, you're undermining the board, which you are a part of. And that is really, really, really challenging because how is anybody supposed to lead in the district You know, when people are now have different ideas and they're going in different directions? So it's really necessary, especially once the vote happens, that you as a board really speak with with one voice um, and, and, and move forward with that one, one idea and one plan. And that's where working with a superintendent, you know, you, you are not sitting at the board table to throw rocks at the superintendent and ambush the superintendent and, you know, rile things up. It's like, you may, you may communicate with the superintendent quite a bit and you may suggest certain things. And at the board table, you can absolutely voice your ideas and, and say what you need to say. But certainly I would say in a positive collaborative kind of a way. Um, and ultimately, you're going to vote the way you think is best. You know, if you're not on board with where things are going, you should cast that minority vote. But if you lose, you, you, you have to you have to stop and take a breath and realize, you know, being on that board is, is supporting that decision. And as Debbie said, that's really, really, really hard. All right. Thanks, Steve. And then finally, the last point, uh, effective boards take part in team development and training. And just as you would expect the professionals in your district uh, need ongoing professional development, you should also expect that of yourself and your colleagues on the board. No one comes to board service knowing everything they need to know. And you know, one of the biggest mistakes is to assume that because you went to school, that you have the information you need. Because in essence, you would be making decisions based on preparing students for your future, right? Not theirs. And so it's really incumbent upon you to take part in uh, professional learning opportunities 
sometimes those learning opportunities will be individually, um, and some of them will take place as part of a team. And that's where the real power lies, is in learning together and having good, rich conversation um, regarding that learning um, so that you're, you're doing the best for students. Okay, so that's the eight traits. Um, I also want to direct you to another resource that's on our website, and you can see the uh, URL there, and it's our Board of Education Governance Standards. And these standards were developed by board members for board members. It is based on the Iowa Lighthouse Research Study as well. Um, and I would really encourage you to, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, and I know somebody um, thanked us for everything we had on the website, they've already been there. But I really encourage you to dig into this document. Um, it talks about standards for individuals as board members, and then it also talks about standards for your board as a whole. And it asks you some really good thought-provoking questions to really say, yeah, does that sound like me? Does that sound like our board or something I want to be a part of? So I want to encourage you to um, check into that. So we've given you a bit of information, and I'm sure that some of you would like to have talked, uh, you know, have us talk more in depth, but it's a short period of time we're spending with you this evening. Um, but I want you to ask yourself a few questions at this point. I think the first two are pretty easy to answer. Do I meet the candidate eligibility, right? Those five points that Shelly shared with you. And do I understand the role better, right? Am I, am I clear that this is about governance and not about management and daily um, operations? And so if you can answer yes to those two, then I would ask you to make um, a real, um, some real thought, give some real thought to the following two questions. Are you ready to make the commitment? So unless you've chosen to run for a seat that has been vacated, and so it's a shortened term, most of you are going to be running for either a four-year seat or a six-year seat, depending upon what your district selected um, years ago uh, when they had that option. And it's really clear, you know, you need to really say, am I ready to make that time commitment? Um, it's more than the one or two meetings a month that you see um, maybe being, um, you know, streamed. Um, there is homework that's needed for those and other meetings. There's events to attend. Um, there's those board development opportunities. And, and there could be more things depending upon your district. Sometimes you're liaisons to buildings or other organizations. And so is this the right time for you? And being honest with yourself to say either yes or no. And maybe today is not the right time based on other commitments in your life. And maybe it's a future commitment instead. Or maybe now is the right time. But really making sure that if you're going to make the commitment you're going to do it knowing that it's going to take some work and effort and extra time away from your family and friends and, and, and your other responsibilities. And then the last one, why are you running? And so hopefully, I'm going to say right out front, I, I hope it's not the accolade you expect to get or the big paycheck or the perks, because those are pretty few and far between. I think I could probably count those on one hand in my 15 years of service. Um, but that it's really something more along the lines of you want to give back to your community or you want to ensure that the best opportunities are available for the students um, in your community and across the state, or that you feel that you have some experience or expertise that would be beneficial to the governance team. Steve, anything to add there? Uh, probably the number one question that I get of people looking to run is how much time does it take? And, and, you know, as I think Debbie covered it. Um, it, uh, what, what I always tell people is it, it takes as much time as you let it. And I have to remind myself, like, that's not the job that I do that pays the bills. You know, it's, it's a largely a volunteer job. We get $30 a meeting in Clarkston, which, you know, I just got my six month check that was $180. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I've got to, I've got to put effort in commensurate with that. And I will say when I started, I didn't know, uh, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know what it was like to be on a school board. So I tried to attend everything I could. And at the time, like 
I did not have kids when I first ran for school board and I had much more time and I got to attend a lot more school events and a lot more MASB conferences and classes and things like that. And now, you know, I, m many years later, I, I have kids in school and I'm excited that I can volunteer in their classrooms and be a, a school board parent. Uh, but I, I've got to balance, okay, how many classes do I still want, need and want to take and, and how can I be involved? And it changes and everybody can take kind of a unique approach. But like if, if you have a day job that requires you to be there, you know, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and you have no time off or not enough time off, like it, it's not a deal breaker, absolutely, but it's going to be tough to fit in the kinds of things that you need to fit in to be an effective school board member. And again, that, those are some conversations I would highly recommend talking to your other school board members that are already elected, maybe the superintendent and, and, you know, try to understand what is the, what is your local, you know, process, you know, how many committees, every board is different. Some have a lot of committees, some have no committees, um, you know, really understand what, what is appropriate to put in, because certainly even if you get elected and you don't have to, put, you don't put that extra time in, but everybody else is, Obviously, that's going to be a rub on your board because the rest of your team is going to wonder why you're getting away with not doing doing your share. Um, and so th those are some of the the nuance to it, I think. I, I look at it like, you know, it, it can be extremely rewarding. And some of the things that I've, I'm proud to say we've accomplished in, in my time is, it, you know, makes it worth it. There are plenty of times when I wonder, is it is it really worth it? Am I really having an impact? But it, for me, if it, I wasn't having an impact and I didn't feel like I was still positively contributing, like I would definitely, I would hang it up. I would go do something else. I have plenty of other things in my life to, to spend time on if this isn't having an impact. But it, it's really awesome to, to, you know, be a part of some of the things, you know, like when, you, when we talk about academic accountability and you're really saying, hey, how do, we, how do we take this group of fifth graders that maybe isn't performing as well? What resources can we direct there to, to boost their performance? You know, and, and when you put those things in place and you see, hey, now all students are doing better, and including those that we're targeting, that's really what, uh, what, what the payoff is. When you see those kids graduating every year, I feel like, you know, at, at senior awards and graduation, you know, you hear about kids doing more things than they've done the year before. And I think that's amazing. And now kids have a lot more opportunities with, with uh, things they can do virtually while they're still in high school. It, it, it's truly amazing. That, that should be, if you want to positively contribute there, that's a great reason to run. If you're not happy with the football coach, probably not the best reason to run. I would even tell you that you could probably affect the football coach better not being a school board member than you know, getting on the school board and being a school board member. And I think we've had a few of those people over the years and it's frustrating for them because you know, 90% of what we're dealing with, they don't seem to engage on and, and you know, get involved with. And it's just a very narrow piece and nobody else wants what they want. And so nothing happens. And that's really, really challenging. Thanks, Steve. So we've had a couple of questions. What's the average monthly hour commitment? And that that's going to depend from district to district, as Steve mentioned, whether you have committees, subcommittees or not, or whether you use a committee of the whole structure. I would say you're looking at a minimum of 10 hours a month. Would you say that's fair, Steve? Yeah, I think so. Like it, it really like you want to look at probably first and foremost, how many meetings there are. And, and the time in the meeting is, is certainly the, the base. Now you need to prepare for that meeting. And so some packets you get might be 10 pages. Some packets you get might be 300 pages. And so, you know, if you're a fast reader and you easily understand things, like it'll be a little less time. If, if you're really detail oriented and you're going to read every single word and get really detailed and ask questions on what every single word means, like I did when I started, um, I didn't know anything. And so I was really asking a lot of questions like that took a lot more time. You know, now when it's the 20, 22nd time I'm approving a budget, like that goes a little quicker. The 22nd time I'm approving tax rates. You know, I know what those things are. I know how to read it. I, I don't have to ask a lot of questions. So there's there's that time. And then the, the you know, what events are you expected to attend? You know, do you, in our my district, we split up schools and we attend their PTA meetings and PTO meetings and and those kinds of things. Um, when when uh, you have committees, there's committee meetings. How many committees are you going to be on? How long do they meet? How often do they meet? So I mean, you could you could easily get to you know ten hours, and uh, that's probably reasonable. But again, you get to throttle a little bit, right? Like if you find yourself 
just diving in and spending, you know, 20, 30 hours, you've got to probably pump the brakes and, and, and figure out where to uh, uh, direct your energy. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of other questions around curriculum. And yes, the board does adopt curriculum, um, but typically that curriculum is, um, that recommendation is brought to the board by the superintendent and whatever structure has been put in place in that district. And so sometimes there are committees uh, that are strictly internal staff members. Sometimes there are community members as well. Uh, so again, you know, it varies from district to district, but definitely boards do have some impact on curriculum through their adoption. Um, and then uh, the same thing would be true of policies. Your administrative team is going to be bringing new policies um, for your approval. Um, you may have some work in subcommittees around those, uh, but again, it varies from district to district. So I want to make sure we cover all of the items that we promised you. So um, I'm going to ask Shelly to go ahead and um, talk about our the actual election itself and some things that you need to know about the election. Thank you, Debbie. So we covered why there was a need to run and the roles and responsibilities. So what steps do you need to take to get your name on the ballot? Um, there are two options for you to get on the ballot. First, you can pay a filing fee of $100 and complete the affidavit of identity. You can pick up the paperwork you'll need from your district filing official, which in most cases will be your local clerk. If you're not sure, you can call your district's board of education office to get the answer. The second option you have is to complete, a nom is to complete nominating peti petitions. If you live in a school district with a total population of less than 10,000 people, according to the most recent census data, you'll need just six signatures of registered voters, but no more than 20. If the total population of your district is over 10,000, you'll need 40 signatures of registered voters with a maximum of 100. And you'll notice that there's a range given for the number of signatures you need. The tip here is to buffer the number of signatures you collect by 10 or 15, of course, um, to make sure that you meet that minimum. Um, the reason to have a buffer in place is that your nominating petition is not actually, if, you're, if someone that signs your nominating petition is not actually a registered voter, the signature is invalid. Unfortunately, your district filing official probably won't reach out to you to let you know how many signatures you're short. So if you only have six signatures and one of them is thrown out because they weren't a registered voter, that um, buffer would make sure that you had enough signatures. And then you can see here, there's a great video to watch on our website. You can see the URL right there that goes into a little bit more depth about campaign um, about financing. So let's talk about some of the key election dates you'll want to make note of. Probably the most important besides the election is the filing date. And that's when you need to have all your paperwork completed and turned into your district's filing, your district filing official. This filing, the deadline for this year is Tuesday, July 26 at 4 p.m. So it's right around the corner. If you have a change of heart or for whatever reason you decide you would like to be removed from the ballot after filing your paperwork, you can submit a written withdrawal by Friday, July 29th at 4 p.m. So you have a three-day window if you change your mind. Write-in candidates must file a declar declaration of intent form no later than 4 p.m. on October 28th. And I'm going to turn it over to Debbie, who's going to talk a little bit more about what can go wrong here. Getting to unmute myself, you think after two years of being on Zoom meetings, who would even remember to do that? Um, so imagine that no one files. Uh, the filing deadline comes and goes, and no one files for a seat. And so now it becomes uh, optional for a write-in candidate. And so imagine that someone in your community who you would prefer never be someone uh, in a governance role of your school district actually goes to the, the um, county official and files their write-in candidates information. 
And a week later, approximately, right, um, because the general election was on November 8th, that individual needs how many votes to be elected to your school board? Anybody want to pop something in the chat? One. One. Absolutely right, Valerie. They can vote for themselves. They can never tell a single soul they put their name on the ballot. And if they're the high vote getter and they're the only person who, who filed the write-in paperwork, they might be your next board member. And so, you know, even tonight after this, you know, this, this conversation that we're having, if you decide that it's not you who's running, talk to others. And, and if maybe you know someone else who, who either has the opportunity to give up their time or um, someone who you think would be a, a good candidate but making sure that those seats don't go on file for. Thank so. you, Debbie. This year's election is on November 8th. We've probably said that about 20 times today because we want you to remember that. This year's election is on November 8th. So um, as Debbie said, make sure to encourage people. Um, and Debbie, did you go over the term of office? I'm sorry. But not yet. Okay, so. all right. So, but... Following the election, there will be a certification for the election, usually within a week, which simply verifies the results. The next step is to officially accept your position. This is done by filing your acceptance of office paperwork with the secretary of the board. This is very important to do within the 10-day deadline. Otherwise, you could lose your position on the board. If you're elected, your term in most cases would then begin in Jan on January 1st of 2023. The caveat here is if you're running for a partial term that has a future expiration date and you'll select and you'll select that if you're running for a full term or partial term when you submit your paperwork. And Debbie's going to talk about those circumstances because it can get a little hinky there. with the Yeah. So the one thing I'm going to say is if you have any question all about when your term of office begins, talk to your school district and or your election official. But for instance, most of you who run, who choose to run, are going to start January 1. If you run for a full four or six year term, you're going to start January 1. Um, however, those, those seats that are partial seats that have been filled because someone stepped down, there's a, there is a caveat there. And so if that election was scheduled, if that seat was scheduled to be vacated um, after the November 2022 election. So it's, it's actually, you know, on the ballot, just as it would have been if that individual stayed in their seat, then you too would still start on January 1. However, if that partial term is filling a seat that did not set to expire this year. So let's say that that off that particular seat would have been on the ballot again in 2024 that's when that seat was set to expire. Then what will happen is that person who was appointed to fill that seat was only appointed until the certification of the next election, which means then let's say it's you that won that, you would actually start, your, your office would begin once you take that acceptance of oath. So sometime in mid-November, you would actually begin your school board service. You would not be waiting till the January one. But again, any question at all, contact your, your uh, local election official or your school district. They'll know which start date is right for you. And I would add, do, do not wait for the filing deadline. We've had a couple of cases where somebody went to the wrong office, was close to the deadline by the time they got to the correct office it was too late they didn't end up on the ballot and so please 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 a few days early at least like that is going to be the the best way to go and make sure all your stuff is is in you can check in our area there's a website you can check if you end up on there but i'm sure you can call if there's other other counties that don't have the website connection to make sure you're you got everything in appropriately Thank you, Steve. All right, so let's talk about the post-election checklist. So all your materials have been submitted, the election's over, you've been elected to represent your school district as a school board member. 
Um, this is your, well, first of all, congratulations to you. Way to go. This is your post-election checklist. Like I mentioned, the certification of the election will have, happen usually within a week following the election. And you'll want to make sure to officially accept the office within 10 days of the certification. There's a non-official oath of office and often your district will do a ceremonial oath of office with your official board member, with your fellow board members. You'll do the official oath of office when you submit your paperwork for the acceptance of office. Your district will schedule the ceremonial oath if, something, if it's something that they do, and this usually takes place closer to the start of your term. If you are subject to filing requirements of Michigan's Campaign Finance Act, having more than 2,400 students in your district or spending or receiving more than $1,000 for your campaign, you'll also need to file a post-election campaign statement prior to taking office. Again, this is likely filed with your local clerk and there are more details in our candidates guide. Okay, so um, a few more pieces of information um, and then know that we are willing to stay on and answer questions after the 7.30 when we complete this rolls around. We, we wanna make sure that we get your questions answered. Thanks to Ann for um, posting the uh, link to where you can find all of the videos. Um, we do have some questions about the paperwork around uh, the office name. And it's been a little while since I filled that out, but I think it should probably be Board of Education Trustee. Um, and then, yes, it is a nonpartisan in Michigan. Uh, so those were two questions I wanted to make sure um, we tackled. So let's, let's say, again, you've been elected. Um, what can you do to get ready to serve? So that that certification takes place in November. You don't start till January. Do you just sit around and wait? Absolutely not. There are a number of things that you can do. The first thing I would suggest is that you contact um, your district, either the board president or your superintendent, ask them if they have a new board member orientation process. And um, in many districts, there's a very formalized process around setting up meetings with um, different key cabinet members, et cetera, to go over budget documents and other things. Um, and then in other districts, it's a little bit more laid back um, and not quite so structured. So reach out to your board president and your super or superintendent and find out what it is they do um, to help support new board members. I would also suggest that you consider asking for a mentor. Maybe you already know someone on the board that you would feel comfortable with. Um, having them be your mentor. If not, you could ask the board president to assign someone. They're just sort of that go-to person when you have questions, when you're getting ready for your first few board meetings. Um, you know, uh, they might attend a class or two with you to just sort of help you feel a little bit more comfortable in that new role. You see CBA 101, the Fundamentals of School Board Service. That's where that video was that I mentioned and that you saw earlier um, in the session. Um, by all means, have your district sign you up for this class. Most districts have a budget um, that the board has approved for professional learning. And um, so it usually doesn't have to come out of your pocket. There are also state funds now to reimburse the district for learning for board members. So absolutely, even if you never took another class, although I don't want to suggest that, but um, just taking this class alone will really help to sort of set you off um, on good solid footing. We offer it um, online, we offer it virtually and in person. So lots of opportunities uh, to take advantage of that learning. Uh, the next piece of individual learning that you're going to want to look at is the state mandated superintendent evaluation training. For those of you whose districts uh, use a July 1 to June 30th uh, superintendent evaluation cycle, you're only going to have a few minutes, a few months to get your training in on the instrument that your district uses. So you're going to want to reach out to your superintendent's office, find out what the instrument is and how you go about getting that training so that you can participate in your superintendent's evaluation when it comes up. For those of you that follow a calendar year, you're gonna have a little bit longer before you have to worry about getting that training in. 
but it is the only mandated training that Michigan has for school board members. So by all means, you're going to want to get that taken care of before you're um, evaluating your superintendent. And then um, we also encourage you after taking uh, CBA 101 that you complete the 100 level classes and get um, your certified board member award. Those classes dig in much deeper. We had those questions around curriculum and policies earlier. There's a whole class on curriculum and what board members need to know. There's also a class about policy. There's one on finance and legislation. So they dig real deep into those topics so that you have a much better understanding if there's an area that um, we need a little bit more information on. Um, in addition to our online courses, because all of those 100 level courses are also available online. Um, and again, you can take those right after you've been certified, just contact your district. Um, we'll also be hosting our December, what we call our CBA weekend, where we offer a whole bunch of classes and those will be in person. Um, and so you'll want to sort of get that on your calendar and um, ask your district how you go about um, getting registered for those classes. It's a great way to get some learning in before you actually sit in that seat um, for your very first board meeting. All right, Shelly, back to you for a bit more information on resources, and then we're going to take questions. Thank you, thank you. So I want to just quickly go over um, our website and some of the resources available for you on your school board journey. Our website is masb.org. That's where you'll find most of the resources we've already discussed tonight. You'll also be able to access our publications. And depending on how you like to learn or absorb information, we use a variety of different channels. So there's something there for everyone. You can access Dashboard, which is our bi-weekly e-newsletter. We also have news from the Capitol, which is weekly and alerts our members and advocates on what's moving through the Michigan legislature as it relates to public education. Storyboard is our monthly video newscast. Soundboard is our twice monthly podcast. And Leaderboard is our magazine, which has three editions each year. That's winter, spring, and fall. Our website is where you'll also be able to find our events calendar. And once you're elected, you'll be at, able to access our member center. We encourage you to poke around on our website now um, just to have a feel for what's available and it will certainly help you in your first year. And on our website, I wanted to point you to our MASB bookstore. We have a wealth of publications available, some from the National School Board Association and some of our original publications. These five in particular are ones that we recommend for the first year of school board service because they'll really set you up for success and help you grow in your new role. The open meetings guide is, a much, is much easier to digest than um, the Open Meetings Act. Surviving your first year answers many frequently asked questions from new members covering topics like policy, communication, meeting agendas, and more. The revised school code is another policy related publication, and it's a quick reference guide to Michigan's revised school code. The next two publications are from the National School Board Association. If we were to recommend one book for you to pick out of these five, it would be Becoming a Better Board Member. Um, this is a very handy resource that covers a lot of topic areas around being a school board member. The last book is NSBA's The Key Work of School Boards, which goes over the core skills of effective school boards. Again, that's at masb.org backslash bookstore. We have just one more town hall event remaining before the quickly approaching filing deadline. Our ask of you is to help us spread the word. If you forward the Get On Board website or Facebook page to one or two people, that would be a huge help to us. Like I said, really the goal of this campaign is to reach beyond our members and educate those around the state on the important role that school board members play. Anyone can register for, for these events for free at, Get On, at the Get On Board website or download our 2022 Candidates Guide as a resource. So sliding into home a few minutes late. Uh, thank you for spending time for us. As Debbie pointed out, we are happy to stick around and answer any questions that you may have. Um, you know, I also wanted to point out the get on board email on this slide. So if any questions come up after you get off here tonight, you can always use it as a resource um, and don't hesitate to reach out to us.